Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I'd like to introduce my guest today, Mark Levy. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mark is uh, from Salem, Massachusetts, and Mark is a writer, and uh, his uh, writing has been published in uh, uh, New Millennium Writings, Cutthroat, WLA, Stone Canoe, and other, other publications. And Mark also has a book out, and I'll ask the cameraman to come in close here. The book is called uh, How Stevie Nearly Lost the War. We can zoom in on that. And uh, we, this is a book of uh, vignettes and short stories, I might tell our audience. But I think a very important part of your uh, past is that uh, you are a Vietnam veteran, uh, around 69, 70, um, and your writing is really inextricably, inextricably tied to that war, that Vietnam experience, and we're going to talk in depth about that. Um, you were a medic in, in, uh, in Vietnam, and I do have a, a photo uh, that I like the... Uh, the cameraman to uh, come in on. This is a photo of you. Do you remember exactly where this was or about where this was, Mark? We were on the patrol. The circumstances on, of this? We are on patrol in Song Bay. Yeah. And that's uh, just a little bit northwest of Saigon? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there you see. And um, uh, Mark, you're... you're um, when you left, and we'll, we'll kind of circle back into the service, but you, you left the service uh, with classic signs of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we're going to talk about that, and you can tell us about what was happening. But I, I do want to preface that before I turn that over to you, to say that about 50 years ago, the term post-traumatic stress disorder probably wasn't even used back then. And I don't know whether it was a... Uh, something that was recognized by the military, by the Veterans Administration, or by doctors, but it's something now certainly that, that we know what it is and, and so forth. So uh, kind of tell us, when you segued out of the Army, and we'll, and we'll kind of get back to your last posting, which was here in Devons, not far from here, but tell us how, w what was happening to you? You didn't even realize what, what was happening. Tell us some of the things that were going on after, uh, shortly after you left the service. I think it's uh, good to backtrack just a little bit. Please. Uh, when I got back from Vietnam, I had a year left. Right. And so when I reported to Fort Devens, they wanted me to pull guard duty and KP and uh, salute officers and stuff. And I just couldn't do it. And I refused. And I refused several times. And went AWOL once. And the short of it was that... Uh, I was uh, given a series of Article 15s, which are basically traffic tickets, and then two court martials, one a summary court martial, which is not that bit much. But a special court martial is kind of a big deal. And uh, they, the, the first sergeant, all these people that I was subordinate to, they thought I was just trying uh, to be a smart aleck. But I, I, I just couldn't. Uh, be obedient to authority when it came to these menial jobs. I, I, I think basically what it was, I had some dignity, and I wasn't going to compromise it by returning back to this old uh, form of, now you've got to pick up trash, and you've got to get a haircut, and you've got to salute officers. I just can't do that anymore. Uh, so I've written about it, and uh, I got out. And uh, once I went into college, uh, I don't know if it was so much PTSD, I just didn't have any sense of direction. You know, so I just ended, ended up taking whatever courses I felt like and partying a lot and meeting a lot of women and having basically two sets of friends, uh, very bright guys and very disturbed uh, guys. Mm -hmm. So cultivate culture on one side and, and frankly violence on the other. Yeah. I was lucky that uh, nothing happened. And your, and your family, you have a brother? Is I that, do. Uh, and your family, mother and father, brother, they didn't know what was going on either, you, and you couldn't explain it to them either. Uh, they just uh, were incapable. 
I mean, they, they had uh, some pretty serious emotional problems themselves. And uh, they were kind of blue collar, uh, not that well educated. And it, they didn't have the capability to uh, empathize. Uh, so friends kind of understood, you know, there's a little something amiss here. Uh, college went pretty well. Uh, but when I finally got into work and, and uh, a couple, series of jobs and the basic issue was uh, clashing heads with authority. Yeah. 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 And, and, it, and it, it, you think that that was caused by the fact that coming back from a situation like a war situation, that this, this just seemed too menial, too... Um, uh, how, how would you explain that? I think that I just uh, had a lot of, like a lot of guys, I just had a lot of uh, anger and a lot of sorrow and a lot of grief. And uh, I didn't know it. I just had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And, yeah. And you and I, I know that the, the, the story that, that you told about not wanting to pull KP, not wanting to salute or cut your head, it's one of those stories in your um, in your book. And you do uh, try to disguise yourself. You don't do do good a job of it. But the uh, this Stevie is actually you, and and I think you referred to another character as Robert when you uh, back when you're in South America. Um, now now some of the uh, the classic signs of, of PTSD, you know, nightmares um, and uh, flashbacks. Uh, reaction to, to over overreaction to certain kind of noises or keeping weapons around that all manifested uh, w with you oh it did yeah uh, anxiety depression uh, sudden anger a uh, really heightened startle reflex I, mean, I I still have it but nowhere near what it used to be like yeah uh, uh, just feeling like nobody understands me alienation uh, just being able, just going south in a really big way. Uh, nightmares, crying spells, standard yeah. stuff. Yeah. And now you, you also, uh, you got involved in some anti-war activity when you were in Devons or shortly after you got, you were, you, you left the service. Is that, tell us about that. I did. I looked into some guys who were uh, involved in this place called the Common Sense Bookstore and right outside of the base and air, and uh, hooked up with an English teacher who was teaching a course in poetry for GIs. And uh, I actually uh, shook hands with Daniel Ellsberg. It was either before or after he broke the papers, somewhere in Boston. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, to be honest, I really didn't have a political consciousness at that time or a moral conscience. I was still rebelling at a, at a fairly uh, remedial level. It took years and years to, to gravitate and evolve to something more um, sophisticated than just uh, rebelling against authority. Yeah, and I might, I might, for the benefit of our audience, the younger uh, members of our audience, I might add that Daniel Ellsberg was the reporter who broke the so-called Pentagon Papers, uh, which were classified documents which showed that from the commander-in-chief at that time, um, Johnson, and the military were all lying to the American public about what was happening with the war effort. I won't go into a lot of the details, but but it was a big cover-up that uh, Daniel Ellsberg did did uh, bring to the light of uh, light of day. Um, now, when did you when did you actually start to write, Mark? I actually started writing, kind of incidentally, at Devon's. I started writing down my nightmares, mm -hmm. and I didn't know why. I just thought I, I saw I had this access to a clunky typewriter at the Common Sense Bookstore, you know, one of the old Underwoods or whatever it was. And I would just write them, type them up, and I, I sort, sorted them away someplace. And so that was the start, real, real simple start. Yeah. And then uh, when I was in uh, college, uh, I started writing cathartic poetry. N not very good, but on my own. And uh, just another bump up. And then, uh, right in the, say in the 80s, I was in another school, uh, I just started to write these little recollections and was surprised, you know, that surprised. And a few of them made it to some kind of underground magazines, you know, the initial wave of Vietnam vet literature. Mm -hmm. Not very good, my stuff not very good, but a, 
just another step in, in that ladder. And then uh, around the early 90s, uh, when I was traveling, I, was, I, would, I got into the habit of writing the same letter like four times to four different people and not knowing that this, that was a really good way to just uh, dr- discipline myself and to remembering what I had written before and then polishing up for the next person. Yeah. And some of those letters later on became the sources of uh, stories. Yeah. Now, did you ever think when you were writing, did you ever think that you would be publishing these, uh, the, your writings eventually, or did you just, just do it because you wanted to do it and felt like doing it? Initially, just writing. Yeah. And then uh, around... Uh, somewhere in the 90s, I met a woman who lived by uh, the main post office in New York on West 33rd or so. And she was a very good writer, and she had some plays uh, done and, and off-Broadway, produced. And she took me under her wing, because we had seen a... Uh, I met her at a production of this little uh, play called Tracers, an early Vietnam drama, Vietnam vet drama. And... Uh, so for a, maybe a year, I would go to her place once or twice a week with just this stuff that I was just writing, whatever it was. And she was yeah. very supportive, and that was another step. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the word cathartic, and um, certainly um, P, for people suffering from PTSD, writing, writing their experiences is considered one of the primary ways of, of getting this catharsis, of getting, you know, reaching in and, 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 trying to, and, and getting those emotions out. And, and uh, I, I take it in your case, that was the primary way that you were able to, 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 to get this catharsis of your experiences is by, is by your writing. Well, I, I, I think you're onto something because I had gone to the VA in the 70s and for therapy. And I met one good doctor. It turned out he was a Vietnam vet. He, he was a FAC pilot, uh, forward air control. So he flew sort of reconnaissance, a very dangerous job. And uh, he and I connected. But these other guys, they're just pushing pills. So it didn't really get much done in the way of excavating what, what's making me tick the way, I'm, the way I was. Uh, and then writing eventually, uh, without my knowing it, served that purpose in a, in a more productive way. Yeah. Now, now, you mentioned um, traveling around the world, and I might tell our audience that there came a time when you left the States and you went to, you traveled in, in, um, in uh, uh, Central America, you traveled in Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and, and what was this, uh, how did this happen? What, what made you, I think the first place you went was down to Central America, if I'm not mistaken. So what, what did you hope to get or did you even realize why you were traveling? What was going on there, Mark? I, I've been involved in uh, uh, U.S. Uh, policy, basically anti-U.S. policy in Central America with a group called CISPIS, a committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador. And they were basically protesting the way the U.S. was uh, training the soldiers and trying to manipulate a civil war. Uh, and unbeknownst to me, I was uh, empathizing with the peasants and the people who were getting uh, hammered by the government soldiers and uh, the, the army, uh, which were all backed by the, the U.S. It's a terrible time in the history of El Salvador. Uh, tens and tens of thousands of people were killed. So th- it, there was just something, it, it was like an immediate connection. These people are hurting. And I gravitated emotionally to that. So, uh, and I was also involved with some Nicaragua stuff. This, Similar in principle, the U.S. as a country involved in another country's political business. So I went first to Nicaragua with a group called uh, Central American Healthcare Workers, National Central American Healthcare Workers, with some social workers and uh, nurses and uh, one or two doctors. And that was a great experience, but there was an itinerary and we brought medical aid and we talked to some people. and didn't meet the Contras that time, okay. but went to some different places and had some good experiences. It was very re- rewarding uh, emotionally. 
Yeah. And I went again with another group, and that's where we met the Contra. I, I'd like you to tell that. Uh, you write about it in your book, but I think it, it was so moving. To me, it was. Uh, tell us about that. That It kind of framed that for us, and tell us about how meeting with, with the Contras, what that was like. Well, it's another group. It was a group of maybe a dozen people. Uh, Witness for Peace. Uh, a group with religious-oriented principles, but uh, ecumenical in their approach to, to uh, basically protesting overt uh, U.S. policies that are counter to what the country itself espouses. So uh, we went down. There was, a, again, a, an itinerary. And eventually we took a, what's called a panga up uh, some river up the coast to Bluefields, which had been hit by a major hurricane in the late 80s. And it was devastated. And uh, it was, uh, you just get into this groove and it's like, yeah, it's happening. It's happening. And we uh, arrived and uh, got onto land and uh, spent a night just kind of getting oriented. And then the next day we had a, a meeting with the Contra in uh, a little wooden, heavy wooden building. It's kind of a secret meeting, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, because yeah. the Contra, the war was over, but not really over. Yeah. And the people in the town uh, feared and hated the Contra, who were the American-backed government uh, militia, yeah. responsible for a lot of uh, bad stuff. So the, uh, the group was made up of uh, civilians this time uh, who just wanted to learn more about uh, Nicaragua. And so I was a lone Vietnam vet and uh, or sitting in this dark, cramped, dank uh, little room and uh, in walked the Contra, four or five guys and sat on uh, little stools on this little sta podium stage and allowed us to ask them questions. And all the questions tended to be polite and uh, just not very imaginative to me. So I opened up and with, a, with a, basically an inappropriate question, which the leader of the delegation, who was a congressional aide, uh, at one point said to me, uh, later, if you had gone on, I would have, I would have stopped you. And I could feel the group was kind of turning against me. So a while passed, and I, I, at a certain point, when there was a pause, I said to the captain, I think, who had been sitting there like a statue, and these people were just remote in their presence. And up to that point, their answers had been factual and congenial and really not very... Uh, telling in what they were relating other than just this kind of surface. Almost like a prepared yeah. sort of remarks, yeah. yeah. So I said, uh, does anybody here have crying spells? Does anybody here have uh, nightmares? Uh, does anybody here ha ever get anxious? I just started laying out PTSD without s bringing up fancy words. And uh, I think the captain was first, and, and he lit up like a Christmas tree, and he related his story. And then uh, this other kid who was packing a, 30, a 38, which we didn't know, he lays out his story, pulls out the gun and says, I, I carry it wherever I go. I never shot anybody who didn't deserve being shot. And then this blind guy who had been blinded uh, by a claymore used by the uh, opposing forces, uh, the FMLN, he said he'd been to the CIA to, and, and they'd tried to help him out with his wounds, but they wouldn't deal with his uh, PTSD. Whereas the, the captain had seen a bush doctor and a kid, and, and that helped him. He ignited some, some herbs and told him to, to uh, inhale the vapors. And he did that, and, and he was okay because prior, whenever he got up in the morning, he just had blood in his throat, and he wanted to kill somebody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the kid said that, uh, I mean, it was classic. He said, whenever I, you know, if I hear anything, Car backfires, fireworks, loud, sudden noise. I, it, I, it, it drives me crazy. And that was the most, uh, to me, that was, that was the reality and the, the most uh, authentic moment in that meeting of Contra. And it mirrored your experiences as well. And, yeah. and you, you, actually, you actually had sort of a, 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 a meeting with this, uh, with this person. It was and, difficult because after it was over, I... I what do I do? I, I walked over to the captain and I thought, should I shake this guy's hand? Because when I spoke inappropriately, I just blurted out, you guys, yeah. why did you kill the women and children? Why did you kill the livestock? Why did you line people up 
against the walls and just uh, execute them. So they stopped. They didn't answer it. They just, they just you know, dismissed it. So when it was all over, we kind of looked at each other, sized each other. This is the reality, and because the story is different. I, 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 I fictionalized things. But in reality, uh, I can't remember if we shook hands, but I remember I wasn't sure what to do. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and, and he did take out the cigarette, and he did take a big, long drag on the cigarette. It was like, it was like Casablanca with Bogart. And he took this drag, and he blew the smoke into the air, uh, into the dark air, backlit by one or two spotlights. And he said, man, I've seen some bad stuff, using another word. Yeah. But it was, it, was, it was all there. Yeah. Now, you, had, you, you relate in, in the book uh, uh, an experience that you had uh, where during a nightmare. You, you actually kept a forty five, a loaded forty five, next to you. And t talk about the nightmare about the, 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 the almost, uh, uh, you know, shooting the guy's leg off. Well, I was in Vietnam. Yeah. And we were being, apparently we were being followed because the, this was the last day of our stay in Cambodia. We'd been there 45 or six days making a lot of contact, losing a lot of people, basically wounded, and killing a lot of people, frankly. And uh, we were told that to, uh, we were being followed and everybody should uh, be extra alert, two men on every position, on guard. And uh, I went to sleep with my holster on and my aid bag over here and my 16 and my helmet and my uh, rifle near right right nearby and i had a nightmare and the nightmare was that uh, we were being overrun and the enemy were crawling past and i woke up and it was the we we're under triple canopy and the moon was behind the cloud and i could barely see but the nightmare and reality were kind of enmeshed and i saw this foot right in front of me it was my friend jerry because we were sleeping head to foot and uh, i took out my 45 and i pulled the hammer back and I aimed it right at, right at his foot. And then the moon came out, and the sun and, and the light uh, revealed you know, this beautiful golden, uh, silver s moonlight. And I saw the American treads on his boots. And I, I just, you know, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. So I pointed this 45 straight up and uh, pinched the hammer, pulled the trigger, placed the, the hammer back into the well. And, uh, and then I slipped the 45 back into my holster and uh, went back to sleep and never told him until maybe 25 years later. And his response was, I'm glad you didn't shoot me because it would have put a dent in my golf game. <laughs> Making that. Now, I, I, um, um, I, I've gotten, we have about four minutes, three or four minutes left, and uh, we're, we're going to do a part two of, of, this, of this program for the benefit of our viewers. Um, and uh, what I'd, I'd maybe like you to do, uh, you brought some of your, your writing with you, Mark, and maybe I'll let you pick out maybe a poem or, or maybe a segment uh, of, of, of a story or a story out of, uh, uh, out of your book, and maybe you can read that for us, if you would. Would you like to do that? Sure. Uh, I'll read a poem. Yeah, that, that, short. That'd, that'd, be, that'd be terrific, yeah. yeah. Let's do... Uh, this is called 45 Days. Toss me a grenade, he shouts. So I do that, he pulls the pin, ping. He counts three, throws the thing, boom, they must be dead. But now the dread snap their chai -com makes when they pull the string to activate the chemical fuse in the wood handle that flies from the wood line, falls short, twists the machine gun. Wilson, Dorio, Roy, Beck, raise up. Wilson yells, look to the left, they'll try to outflank us. So I do that, the grunts shoot back, then snap, bang, dirt and dust. Everyone hit. After the medevacs lift them away, after we recon for blood trails and meat, we leave this place. Patrols, ambush, jungle monsoon. Not how we wanted, not how we dreamed. No popped smoke in the open field for birds inbound to lift us out. No cooling air till the birds touch down. None of that. 
All day we trudge the dark, wet trails, slip and climb the muddy hills, wade the dark and narrow streams, step so weary with one last heave, we drop our rucks into the killing heat and curse you, love you. Vietnam, Vietnam. Now, did you, did you write that uh, in country, or did you write that when you came back? Uh, yeah, I wrote that about uh, four years ago. About four years ago, okay. Um, now, we're, 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 uh, you also have, for the benefit of our, our audience, you have a uh, website. I do. And it's called Medic in the Green Time. Uh, and uh, Medic is M-E-D-I-C for the benefit of our, of our um of our viewers. And um, uh, now what, what is, uh, tell us what green time means. Tell our viewers what green time means. Well, green time refers to Vietnam. It was a phrase, I believe, of, of a friend of mine, a very good writer, used in conversation. And I said I, to myself and hopefully to him, I gotta use that. And that's how it's, it began. Yeah. Now, uh, I know you used, uh, we only have about two minutes. Uh, you, you mentioned a Claymore mine earlier. Uh, 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 it's one of the most deadly types of booby traps uh, imaginable. Uh, tell, uh, describe to our viewers what, what a Claymore mine is and how yeah. it works. Okay. Well, also I mentioned Chai Kam. Chai Kam refers to Chinese communist, and so it's a grenade. A Chai Kam is a grenade yeah. that they threw at us. So the Claymore which is still legal, by the way. I looked it up. It's a legal weapon, according yeah. to the United States. Yeah. It's, uh, it's about two pounds of C4 plastic explosive uh, and about 700 steel pellets, like BBs, are embedded into it. And then and that uh, mass is sandwiched between a plastic, sh inside a plastic shell. And there are two sets of prongs that you can stick it into the earth. And it's shaped like this. It looks kind of like that, facing outward. Outward, yeah. And it can be detonated uh, electronically or uh, there's a way to booby trap it and uh, so that you hit a trip wire. And, and uh, it's got a killing radius of uh, X amount of yards and it spews these when it blows up. Okay. It, yeah, I mean, one pound of C4 is like 10 sticks of dynamite. So yeah. it's a lot. And then it just, it's like a, if you think of it as a giant shotgun shell. Yeah, and uh, it's it's a it's a it's a terrible weapon. Yeah, it's just literally bodies disintegrate in front of it. it uh, well, um, I'd like to just tell our audience that this has been uh, part one uh, of my interview with uh, Mark Levy, who is a writer and a Vietnam War vet, uh, and we'll uh, stay tuned uh, and we'll have part two for you as well. Um, and I'd like to remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.